my great pleasure to introduce to you Peter Palensky. Uh, I tried to figure out, uh, you know, it's usually he was working for 20 years here and he's still there. No, he has worked, I think, on all continents, or almost on all continents, constantly moving. Uh, seems he's constantly seeking new challenges. And his most recent challenge is electric power grids. So uh, this is uh, going to be very much uh, in time with us today because uh, smart power grids and smart energy are extremely important topics. And by the way, um, I hope that you appreciate the selection of keynote speakers and the topics they cover. We try to do it uh, to make it really interesting for you. So, Peter, it's all yours. Thank you. How much time do I have? <laughs> I'm between, between you and lunch, so I'll try to be brief. Um, the idea was that I tell you a bit about uh, how we deal, how we try to understand the electrical and intelligent electrical power grids. The previous speaker told us a bit about reality, so I thought I will uh, continue with that. The reality in this room, the air conditioning system. Who knows what that is? A number, yeah, but which number? Uh, I see some knowing smiles, so there are a few individuals who know exactly what that is, apparently. I came to this room before the conference and I counted the number of air molecules in this room. That's what came out. Why do we need that number? Because if you want to do an air conditioning system, you want to control the temperature, for instance, beside other things. And if you want to calculate the temperature, Reality would force us to look at each, and in each individual molecule and take the kinetic equations and how to collide. And by that, we can calculate the temperature of this room. Nobody does that, right? We have something much smarter. We invented something easier than reality, pressure. Yeah? Pressure is not real, pressure is something Macroscopic, but it helps a lot. It helps us to, to, yeah, to do the, the task of temperature calculation much easier. In electricity grids, we are still in the molecule phase. We look at the details. We do uh, admittance matrices, and they are really huge. The more details you want to know and then you calculate around. Yeah? Non-linear equations and other ugly things are there, and they make our lives miserable. That was fine the last 100 years, because systems were simple, were well, not so complex, and the details were not important. But this is changing. Um, the grids are complex already, and what we did was we, we simplified things, we over-engineered everything, money didn't count. Yeah? This is different now. And we are moving the system closer to its limits. Yeah. The safety margins is lost profit. And the last years have only received uh, contracts from power companies that reduce that safety margin. Because that's pure money that is unused and they want it. But if you close that gap to reality, to instability, you want to know for sure where you are. So the details get important. And even more than that, the grid is changing. Yeah. The grid is interacting with all kinds of things because of you, because of computer engineers, computer scientists, and mathematicians. The Internet of Things, blockchaining, everything intrudes our beautiful power system in good intentions, I believe. And things should get better, but it also makes things more complex. So this is a visualization of uh, a snapshot of the Internet. And in the end, if we want to calculate uh, stability, robustness of the power system, we have to deal with these numbers of nodes and these numbers of uh, dynamic players in the grid. The methods we have are uh, not sufficient. Yeah? So people are starting to panic because these things happen anyway. If the power business is prepared or not, doesn't matter. Yeah? Some Googles and some entrepreneurs just do it and it happens. If it works, will be experienced later. 
The power business wants to know before. We want exact models, we want certainty about these things. So we also want something like uh, a statistical method or something that scales with these challenges. Of course, that's a nightmare for every engineer, not knowing the details anymore, but dealing with something fuzzy. Yeah. Most of uh, my kind are not yet there emotionally to accept this, but I believe it will be necessary. Physicists have done this many, many years ago. Yeah. The large and the small details of physics are beyond any reality. Yeah? There are models that work with a strange kind of mathematics, but they're fine. As electrical engineers, we are not yet there, but probably that will be needed. A few slides on why and what. So, why is this happening? One thing is data, as you certainly know. So, we have metering in the past that was a bit of data. And it was already breaking the backs of the IT departments of the power utilities. But this is getting more now. Yeah? These phase, phase measurement units, the PMUs, they are delivering a stream of permanent data, uh, terabytes every week. So this is a new category. But it gets even more. The power companies are now believing that all this big data that lies out there is unused gold. They want to use it for their purposes. So all this will be correlated and used in a real-time loop with the power system. And that's a frightening thing. The last category of intelligent players in the grid is even more fascinating because it's not just a flow of data that comes to me telling me about reality, but I can have an influence. I can talk to a controller. I can talk to a car when to charge, how to charge, and so forth in the future. So that, that turns the entire business upside down. This is not new. We tried it many times, experimentally. So this is a project that I did a long time ago. It was a, a little box, as you can see, where we upgraded industrial processes, cooling, heating, these things. So the box was learning. The time constants was trying to anticipate the load. It had a multi-agent system. They talked to each other and tried to find some economic optimum. And the two curves that you do see down there, I don't want to go into the details, but the black line would show the ideal electric consumer. Yeah. Deviation from the nominal frequency to the right means too much energy in the grid. It consumes a bit more. If the frequency is too small, it consumes a bit less. This is a self-stabilizing effect. So this is how the utilities want the consumers to behave. And by just adding three lines of C code to the controller of the refrigerators, we imitated that behavior, at least statistically, so that these devices as a whole behave grid friendly. That sounds like a very good idea, but the first question that we got from the utilities was, does it scale? What if we have 500,000 of these devices out there? Are there any stability issues? Will they synchronize and do all the same at the same time, which would not be good? And we couldn't give an answer. So it works in a lab, 10, 20 devices. But for everything else, we needed either a big field trial, which was too expensive, or some methods to calculate. And we didn't have these methods. And that was the turning point in my career when I stepped back from that experimental engineering um, efforts and went into the fundamentals of the systems that we are dealing with, trying to understand how do they really work and how can we describe that. The scalability is just one of the many, many challenges. There are much more. Yeah. Um, resilience is a keyword across the ocean. Cybersecurity, how do we update these systems? Yeah? How do they comply with the economics and so forth? So there's plenty of questions that we are currently not capable of answering. But these questions are there. And who has the answer can exploit that. So people around the globe, I'm not the only one, are busy now getting better models and better descriptions of these intelligent uh, power systems. If we step back from such a smart grid and look at the basic ingredients, we see the physics. Yeah, that's all the transformers, cables, and uh, power lines and machines, typically described with differential equations and other uh, physical methods. 
In an intelligence system, we also have IT, uh, typically described with discrete models, state machines, communication protocols, decisions, and so forth is, is in this realm. We also have roles, um, people, uh, stakeholders in, in, in economy, markets. If it's small, you can use game theory. If it's large, you typically use a multi-agent modeling approach where you just look if it works or not. And you also have stochastic and statistical phenomena in such a system. Maybe there are more, but that's at least the four usual suspects that we see, and they are mathematically completely incompatible. Yeah. There is not a language that describes everything in a beautiful and pain-free way. And it's even worse. I pick an example of one of the worlds, in electricity, of course, um, that within one and the same physical domain, we have different types of models. This is the I can also give you examples out of uh, mechanical engineering or other uh, domains. But in electricity, we have one and the same uh, power system grids described with different types of uh, mathematics. Yeah? The phasor domain is uh, the slower phenomena with complex numbers. And the EMT domain is with electromagnetic waves, with wave equations. They describe one and the same physical being, but different phenomena. And if you're changing something, if you're installing a new generator or a switch, you have to look at all these models if it's fine. It's a very tedious job because only one viewpoint only shows you one side of the problem. You have to look from all the sides, and they can be many. So that's the situation in this cyber physical energy system. We have so many different domains, so many different pieces of knowledge, and people involved in languages that it's really difficult to get the models right. So what do we need? We need new methods, of course. Yeah. If it's not there, we have to invent new ones. And um, I'm currently busy with a network of other scientists around the world, with other laboratories, to work on these methods. Um, the goal is to have something modular, reusable, scalable, flexible, that can describe our, our systems. I can tell already now, it's a numerical method that we're currently using, but we all long for a harmony between the analytics and the numerical methods, of course. This is the holy grail, but for the next five to 10 years, we will be working and we'll be happy with the numerical methods that I will show to you in a minute. So how did we approach that uh, problem of inventing something new? Um, we came up with a number of use cases that describe such a complex cyber-physical energy system. The most simple one that we came up with was this one. That's why it has a number one. You have a number of houses with a heating or a cooling system. In this case, it's a heating system. Um, let me walk here. So the physical domain that we see is the heating domain. Yeah? You have a heat flux. Thermal conductivity, you have, a, you have a heater that is controlled by a controller. The controller is uh, configured by a software agent. The software agent gets a price, and the price comes from a market. And the market makes the price out of the consumption of all the houses. And then we have an environment with some weather changes and so forth. By that, we have all the four usual suspects in. We have physics. In this case, it's a thermal domain. Yeah. We have IT with the controllers and the agents. They talk to each other. We have roles with the market and the agents. And we have stochastics. The window opens from time to time and the environment changes. So by, this is a, a very popular case for every student. I think every student in electrical engineering has done this in, in MATLAB and, and other tools. But it forces you to describe these very different things in your modeling language or in your modeling methodology. <coughs> The other use cases were similar. I'll give you just one more example to see why we had different use cases, because the first one covered already everything anyway. The same thing again. You have the houses and the market and so on. But now the power for heating comes from a power station. That was not the case before. It just came out of magic. Now it comes from a power station. Very, very simple one. You have a rotating engine. You have a generator. You have a, a governor that uh, controls the frequency. If the load is increasing, it steps on the gas and, and so forth. So, the advantage is not that we have now a mechanical domain, an electrical domain, 
additionally, because we had physics already. We already had differential equations. This is not new compared to case number one. The new thing is that these houses are now tightly connected. So if this house switches on, the other houses feel it in the frequency immediately, instantaneously. That was not the case before. In the case before, if a house switches on, after many, 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 many hours, the market decides, oh, let's raise the prices because they are consuming so much. But that takes hours. And that's a challenge for the models and for the simulator. In that fashion, we created a number of artificial cases, um, not because they are so interesting, but because they are a challenge to the modeler, to the modeling philosophy, and to the simulation engine. So what options did we then try? After specifying these cases, I distributed them in the community to my friends, to my colleagues, and to play around with it. And we decided we have basically four, no, three options to model. Either we squeeze everything in our favorite tool. Everybody has his favorite baby to describe things. And you have to squeeze the statistics and the physics and the IT and everything into that tool, describe it, and then you can simulate the cases and see what comes out. You can then optimize for an economic benefit that the agents are always stable or converging quickly or have a, an economic benefit for you or a carbon footprint or whatever. That's the application. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the modeling. So option number zero, zero because it doesn't work, was squeezing everything into one tool. Next option is having a super duper tool that does everything for you. It's so powerful that it can host all these different phenomena and these different types of mathematics. Also a very romantic idea. And the third one, or the second one in this case, is combining tools. We'll see what that means. So, squeezing everything into one tool, I've chosen a digital tool for you. That's a, a discrete event simulator, Omnet++, usually used for telecommunication networks. You can describe um, communicating objects, and they have events, and they have a queue. I think you're pretty familiar with that. So what we did is, we have still physics, power station and governors and so forth. We have to transpose that into this discrete language. So we are outsourcing the job of the, of the tool to the job of the modeler. So the model has much more work now, translating these models. Yeah. So we had to um, take the controls and the differential equations of our physics and translate it into something digital. Many, many tries. Um, we had lots of discussions with, within the community um, how to do that, and uh, everybody had another way of doing it, but in the end it was discrete states of state machines to, to, swip, to swap around, because that fits into the modeling philosophy. Yeah. But in the end, what you get is something extremely simplified. So this is, for instance, the temperature rising and falling, depending on if you're heating or not. But this is not how it looks like in reality. Yeah. It might consume the same amount of energy, but the dynamics look different, and if the dynamics are important, you lose that there. Yeah. And we were not even capable of quantifying the error. That's also something frightening. So the simplifications that were necessary, or that are necessary if you squeeze everything into one tool, are so brutal that the solution is basically useless. This is how you present physical models. And that was completely lost. Now there are basically two um, principles. Either you, you know the transfer functions and you can draw the the direction of the signals and how they influence each other, this is the, 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 the Simulink way, or, which is the much more elegant way, is you describe the physics as a white box model, or as an as white as possible gray box model, with the physical equations in between, yeah? the a-causal modeling. So one of these two things are necessary somewhere to make engineers happy. The alternative, the universal tool that goes in this direction. We had two categories. We, we tried different types of tools, and they either were of this block-oriented modular type or of this monolithic type. In the block-oriented, you try to separate your problem into individual problems that are interfacing with each other. Um, an example would be uh, GridLabD. The monolithic one, 
describes the entire system in its entire wealth in equations and tries to solve them. Both are similar in handling, both are object-oriented, so the modeling is kind of similar, but the numerical uh, details are very, very different. The agent-oriented models, we liked it very much, it was easy to understand, and it, and it yeah, corresponded to our way of thinking, deciding, uh, separating everything into blocks. So, what we did, we um, decided how to separate it, this is probably a power line, this is a generator, this is a house, and so forth, and then you have a, a scheduler, in this case it was again a discrete, discrete event scheduler, who um, orchestrated the models, exchanged the variables and so forth. The challenging point is to how to synchronize and how to orchestrate these models. And these um, schedulers had a, a number of very nifty tricks that we liked very much to speed up things and to simplify things. In this case, it was uh, GridLabD, you had a number of objects, so all your elements, even people and markets, everything is described in your objects, it's in C++. You boot them up and ask them, hey guys, time is ticking, please proceed in your existence and tell me if you want to talk to somebody else. Which means when you have something that is of interest for somebody else, because there is an interaction happening between two objects. So each object can decide by itself where the synchronization point should happen. In this case, object three slows down everybody. So this is the latest point where the simulation should interrupt everybody to exchange the variables and tell the objects, okay, now we can start again in the next step. If you decide your objects and your modeling in a smart way, this is very, very efficient. But again, the modeler has to do a lot. Results were promising, so the performance was good, but whenever the physics gets more um, complex, we came to limits very, very quickly. And some of our projects are multi-physics. We have heat networks, electricity networks, and gas and renewables coming in, all together interacting with each other, converti converting from A to B, and everything is important. You, you cannot let these details go away. Yeah. So these types of problems and questions were not easy to do, so in the end, again, didn't work. The other version of these uh, universal super duper tools was the mono monolithic models. Um, the most prominent examples are Modelic and MATLAB, um, Simscape from the MATLAB company. Um, if you like modeling, I can highly recommend looking into Modelica. Um, it's a fantastic, strong, object-oriented modeling language uh, developed by an open source community with good tools behind that. And it's, uh, it's highly addictive. Yeah? So if you, if you start working with that, you don't want to do anything else in your life anymore. It's really uh, a great thing. Um, it assumes that you describe your model or your instances with equations that follow basically the conservation of energy, the fundamental conservation of energy rules. Yeah. Gravity, electricity in this case. So you have potentials and flow and if you have a node of a flow the sum must be zero. Yeah? This holds for water, this holds for mechanical forces, and this holds for electricity and other things, even for heat flux. So with these rules, that the sum in a node is zero and that the potential must be equal, with these uh, rules, the compiler can transform your equations into something that can be executed. That holds for several types of physics. Um, I, will, I will skip that. I just want to show you how easy it is. In this case, I derive a heater out of a dipole, yeah, of, a, of a resistor, and this is how you write uh, the differential equation. You don't have to solve them anymore. You just describe the physics as it is. Are there any mathematicians in the room? If yes, yeah, uh, you're not needed anymore. <laughs> At least in that respect, yeah? We don't have to solve the equations anymore. We just describe them, we write them down as they, is, as they are, and the compiler solves it for us. So it's an incredibly convenient way of describing very, very complex uh, instances.
self-documenting, strong syntax, and so forth. Results were encouraging. Um, what we saw is that it's very good in describing a very complex machine, so it can describe a car engine, that's where it comes from, avionics and automotive. You can describe a car engine with Modelica with all its mechanical, acoustical, electrical, thermal, chemical properties interacting dynamically with each other, and it works. But it's very bad in describing 500,000 engines interacting with each other. So system models are not easy in that language. And the power system is a system of many, many instances interacting with each other. Um, so this super duper tool, again, didn't work. Also scalability was very bad. The performance um, that we need is beyond what these tools or these languages uh, were promising. And uh, so we, we looked for an alternative, and here it is. We um, keep the individual domains of our multi-domain or multi-world uh, problem in their own world. Every domain has its own tool, 30 years old Fortran code, it's validated, the people love it, and you have validated uh, uh, model libraries for it, and, and the people are learning it in university and so forth. So the individual domains have their own tools that work pretty well. And we're trying to combine that somehow. Yeah. So what co-simulation is, basically, is you have uh, multiple models with multiple solvers. Yeah. So this is the definition of co-simulation, that you combine dynamically. I'll skip over that. So how does this coupling work? Um, if you have, in this case, we have just two models. Again, we have synchronization points. Yeah? These models proceed in time in the simulation. The integrator steps forward and has to exchange with the other model <coughs> variables because they are physically, in reality, connected. They are one and the same thing, probably, with two different uh, properties. So. How often we synchronize has, a, has an influence, and how we synchronize has an influence on the accuracy of my output and on the performance of the simulation. And that's the dilemma. Yeah? More accuracy, for instance, this here is an iteration. So between every synchronization point, you iterate unless you converge to a common understanding about reality. Both simulators have a view on reality, and it's not matching usually. And a certain error is allowable, but you have to reach that, and that is typically done with uh, iterations. So that's the, uh, the screw that you have to turn when you're coupling models. Yeah? How accurate do you want to be and how quick do you want to be? It's one of the many, many details. Let's come to an example. Again, a popular example of uh, uh, electrical engineering. You have uh, electric vehicles that are charging, and you want to optimize the way how they charge. So that charging is not only a problem to the grid, but also a solution. The idea is if the grid is in need, maybe there is something broken or something else happened, the charging points and the cars could contribute. They could balance the power flows. They could support frequency and voltage uh, in many ways, yeah? by charging intelligently or even by feeding back energy. So that's one of the promises that EV makers do to the grid companies that uh, the EVs are not only a challenge, but also an opportunity. So we want to look, um, how does this work? Uh, how does it scale? What do we have to be careful with? So this model was also simulated, I think, by every electrical engineering student on this planet in different tools, and it never works. How we did it is we looked at the problem itself and identified the individual domains that we want to have in detail. So what comes out, we have uh, battery simulators, we have power electronics, we have communication networks, and so forth. So each uh, domain that is of interest gets its own simulator. If it's not of interest, then we can simplify it and place it into one of the existing simulators. Yeah? So if power electronics is not important, we just put it somewhere else. But the moment you say it is important because I want to optimize the costs, I want to optimize safety or security or whatever, then we have to have the real models and the experts sitting in front of that model. And this expert is not talking your language, they are talking their own language. So they have to have their own tools and their own models. And then we have to, to couple that. 
as well as the example before with the phasor domain and the EMT domain in, in, in the electricity grids, was the same here. Yeah? So we have to do both. We have a large, large grid with things going on, and we have one small part with the charging car where switching happens. High frequency switching and ugly things that we would like to have a, an eye on. So we had to, to, to merge two models, one with electromagnetic transients, highly detailed in microseconds, and the other one, the rest of the grid, interacting with the car in a more relaxed fashion. So this is how we decompose the problem. What is important? Who wants details? If there is only one party with details and the rest don't care, we just need one simulator. But the moment we have two stakeholders that want to have details, we have to use at least two simulators. The challenge is if you couple these simulators, so that, that sounds fantastic, yeah? we just couple the simulators and everything's fine, but that's uh, only half of the story. There are lots of challenges. Basically, it boils down to the interfaces and uh, how to deal with such a, a simulation. Now, that's a simulation. We have three simulators. They are interacting. And basically, it's used in a, in a design loop where we are optimizing the system. Yeah? Maybe we optimize the design costs, the investment costs, or uh, security margins, efficiency, and so forth. Yeah? This is done in the outer loop. But in the inner loop, we are evaluating. And maybe we need 200,000 simulations. And if this simulation takes a week, we have a problem. So performance, scalability, and the interfacing of these simulators is, is key to make this method acceptable. Because there are, as I said in the beginning, questions by industry, questions by business that want to be answered, and the tool has to work in the end. The case number seven uh, was exactly that with the car charging, so we tried to get models of uh, all the involved uh, phenomena. For instance, the battery model, I got it from a sister department. Next door, they develop batteries. I could also make you a battery model, no problem, yeah? even with memory effects and all these things. But what they did was a totally different magnitude. They had chemical equations of the battery, yeah? 3D, CFD models, and so forth. So that level of modeling, I cannot do that. They gave me the model compiled into an executable that I can plug in into my system model. And this is how we work nowadays. We consult the experts of the various disciplines, try to explain them what we need, how we interface, how we see modeling, and how we can combine that to something that uh, we will all benefit in the end. So by that, we collected or created the models for the battery, for the driving, for the grid, for the controls and for the uh, loads in the grid, and we uh, compiled it to a, a holistic model of an intelligent electric power grid. Uh, there were digital controls involved, communication networks, networks with delays, with packet loss, with batteries that don't like to be treated in a certain way. All these little details were there. There was no need to simplify that. We implemented in a number of ways. So the different teams did it in, uh, with different tools. This is a, a version with commercial tools. For instance, uh, Power Factory is a commercial grid simulator. Um, yeah, the other one are open. <laughs> but uh, we tried. Uh, that was for validation reasons, different types of uh, simulators and modeling elements in our simulation and uh, benchmark them against each other. And the results uh, uh, were very encouraging. So this is uh, the open source uh, variant where we uh, simulate uh, the batteries in Open Modelica and the power system in PSAT and so forth. So the, the tool choice and the flexibility for you as a as an engineer or as a scientist uh, to design your, your platform to analyze these systems uh, is greatly benefiting from that. The modularity is really nice. If you're not happy with a certain tool because it makes troubles, you remove it and plug in another one. Theoretically, it should work. The, yeah, the, the, the discrete part from the uh, driving state machines 
was discrete and stochastic. We got lots of data from uh, car sharing companies and other uh, people that have data how people drive. So we had models of the people sitting in the car, they drive to work, they go to the gym and they come home and then go to the pub and so forth. So we had all these events simulated in a, in a simulator and uh, they were dynamically interacting with the rest of the system. The results were uh, groundbreaking. Uh, no one has done this before. As I said, every student and every scientist on this planet has analyzed how do electric vehicles impact our electricity grid. This is one of the no-brainer questions. Everybody wants to know that. How, how long will it work? Uh, what's the maximum number that we can host and so forth? But everything was always terribly, terribly simplified. Yeah. You cannot trust these results. In our case, there was no need to simplify. Whatever detail you need, we put it in. Yeah. Performance, of course, was the question. The more details you have, the slower it gets. But in this case, we were uh, surprised how, how good it went. For instance, in this case, we have an unbalanced grid, yeah, unbalanced AC load flow. That is something that usually nobody does because it's uh, computationally very expensive and too much details, but we need the details. That was a question of the utility companies and the grid companies. So we had that covered. We had the, the, the real battery model. For instance, when you um, can, mm, when you're rewarded with one euro as a battery, if you do something for the grid, uh, you're compensating some problems in the grid with your power as a battery, but the wear off is worth two euros, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. But you never get these types of information with simplified models. We did that. Yeah. We had the models because we, see, we saw how the aging of the battery happened and how they were worn off with a certain control regime. We could change the controls and we could fix it out. We could even do model-based controls that we have a digital shadow of the entire system running side by side with reality. Another detail that we liked and that was uh, quite challenging to implement was uh, synchronizing of the, of the uh, simulators. For instance, here you see dynamic step sizing control. Uh, very little step sizes here, lots of dots. Here they are more relaxed. Here is one, here is one, here is one. But this, during that time, something happened. So the, the simulators had to exchange lots of information because the controllers were switching. In normal simulation setups, you will just not see that at all. You wouldn't know. Yeah. The, the model is too complex that you see it with a plain eye on paper, and the numerical results don't show it. And this is an ugly thing, yeah, because you want to trust your models, but you cannot. If the details are important, and you, you simplify them too much. Another nice uh, feature of these setups was the the cyber physical aspect, so we, we are now doing penetration testing, we are doing uh, impact analysis of uh, catastrophes and also uh, intentional attacks to the power system. But it's only possible because we combined ICT and the physics. Yeah? So we have real switches there, we have, we have the hardware in the loop, we have emulated ones, we have simulated ones. So the three real emulated simulated is all the same thing in co-simulation. You can plug them together with the same methodology. And in this case, we analyzed how um, communication latency has an impact on controls. Yeah, sometimes we have very bad communication channels, power line communication, for instance, uh, can be distorted. And uh, the controls command that you send away arrives too late. And the question is, where's the limit? Yeah? How to optimize it? When does it get dangerous or expensive? And these are questions that need the details. So in the end, we are quite happy with that. But again, um, this is just a workaround. It's a numerical model. Yeah. It's, uh, it requires try and error. It doesn't tell you the truth. You can make experiments. If you have the simulation up and running, you can run it 10,000 times and see if it discovers some dependencies and some search spaces which are ugly that you can maybe describe with something else. But it's not an analytical tool. This is still our dream where we want to go. Ideally, they would um, support each other, numerical steps with analytical steps to approach uh, 
the modeling of such a very, very complex, unfortunately very large cyber-physical energy system. So the bottom line is a smart grid is a hybrid system. Some call it a heterogeneous system with at least um, IT and physics involved. And they are ugly. Yeah? They have different methods that don't like each other when you describe them on paper and in a computer. With this co-simulation trick, we can partly solve it. We create other problems with it. Um, we have uh, legions of PhD students currently pumped through that topic and they look at the error propagation, how do we describe it, uh, on, on the scalability questions uh, and so forth. So there are lots of answers, uh, lots of questions that, that need an answer. But the cyber physical is just the first step because there are other phenomena that are interacting dynamically with a power system of that kind. So it's a multi disciplinary problem, multidimensional problem, and that's why we also need multidisciplinary tools and teams. We need, unfortunately, several languages that makes project management really difficult, how to um, keep versions of a project, of a model that is described in seven different languages. If you change something, how do you upgrade it? How do you check for validity and so forth? So maybe ontology can help, can help a bit. So that's, again, something that we are really struggling with. And again, we are electrical engineers. We are, we are normally not interested at all in all these things. We're just doing it because nobody else does it for us. Luckily, around the corner in my office, there's the Department of uh, Numerical Analysis, mathematicians. Uh, quite funny people. They never see the daylight, I believe, sit in their office. But uh, we have joint projects and joint students, and uh, they help a lot in all the numerical questions. So we need much more cooperation in that. So co-simulation helps. It currently gives us answers that we didn't have before. So we are happy for the time being. We see lots of very, very difficult problems ahead of us if we want to continue that way. I believe it's solvable, but we need help. We need cooperation with other disciplines. And in the end, the holy grail is, of course, to harmonize our past, the analytics, the mathematics that we used before, and the presence, the numerical methods to something for the future where we have both harmonized side by side. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting and very stimulating. It's nice to see uh, that there are many commonalities between. The, so we gave talks about completely different things, uh, but not completely different. I mean, here you were dealing with uh, again a problem which has multiple perspectives that you have to align these multiple perspectives of proposing a domain-specific language as well that can only be judged adequate to represent the phenomenon if you look at the phenomenon, so the ontology of the domain, the true sense of the word, right? Understanding the particular aspects of the phenomenon such that the language can reflect that. So you're dealing with operational semantics, generating code for simulators. You mentioned patterns. I was wondering if you have uh, thought about uh, anti-patterns as well. I mean, this idea that there could be modeling mistakes that, uh, that are recurrent in different uh, modeling solutions, then if you think uh, an approach like the one I described before could be used to detect and correct these anti-patterns. Hmm. That's luxury problems, I believe, if we would come that far. Um, currently, the models are nasty enough. If we have a grid simulator up and running, so that the grid is designed, so we have all the parameters of the individual components, also the controls and the ICT and everything there, it takes us days to get it stable just in the first seconds of the simulation. Initializing this, these, these models is a nightmare. Um, Anti-patterns in modeling, that would mean that the model describes something that is not possible or not valid, right? We have different levels of validity and possibility. There is the physical reality. Uh, you cannot have uh, two, two birthdays or whatever. Yeah. Same is here. Yeah? But we also have grid code and legal constraints and um, 
all kinds of other soft and man-made uh, constraints that we would also need there in these anti-patterns. And uh, some of them are very, very dynamic. You don't see them in the topology itself because it depends on the past. So you can drive a system in a, in a, in a, in a situation where it collapses, you know, where you have an overload, you have a blackout and all these things, where, where you blow the fuse in the end. And that is not seeable in the, in the static view. You need the dynamics, and uh, that would bring your ontology into a dynamic fashion, mm -hmm. which uh, opens a Pandora's okay. box of... Uh, <laughs> it's even more interesting, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Any more, qu any more questions? Ah. Oh. Okay. I'm gonna get my exercise. Thank you. I was wondering if you often have uh, many goals for your simulation which are contradictory and then you don't know which choice to make because from one side, for one criteria you have, you can make a choice and for another criteria you can make another choice and you don't know which one to choose at any second. Yeah, if, if you mean multi-objective problems, this is the natural case. There are multiple stakeholders involved in, 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 in the decisions that are then based on these models. Yeah? So I can give you an example. I, for many years I've done smart city projects. That's a buzzword of the past. But at that time we did lots of projects in China and in Singapore, Southeast Asia, optimizing entire cities. Yeah? Five, six, seven million people living there and you try to make a plan for the next 15 years to make it carbon neutral and other things. So, models were used to calculate what happens if I subsidize rooftop photovoltaic? What happens if I punish diesel engines and so forth? How does it backfire, including the socioeconomic uh, dynamics? I was only responsible for electricity. But anyway, the big projects were always starting with a so-called stakeholder um, meeting. So the, the district heating company was there, the housing association was there, the politicians were there, and so forth. And in the end, we had not only multiple goals and opinions that are contradicting, of course, the value that you squeeze out, because what the model gives you is knowledge. You can look inside and optimize the system as a whole, so as an economy, as a country, you will benefit. Yeah? There will be less energy wasted, and this is always good. It's a no-brainer. But somebody might suffer. Huh? The individual business case might suffer from that. So this is what the, the model can tell you. And what we needed in the end, and this is not a joke, we had psychiatrists hired to be with us in these meetings. To keep people down, yeah? to calm them down, and to explain them we are talking about the same problem and we can share the benefit that we squeeze out of the system evenly. Because if you let these people lose onto each other and you tell them, hey, I'm coming now and I will change something in your city, they will freak out. So it's not only a multi-objective problem that can be humbly described with a formula, it's emotions, it's business cases, it's hidden agendas that you don't know. There are me mechanisms that are not in your model. That's the, that's the biggest problem sometimes. Yeah? Because they have reasons to decide in a certain way and they don't tell you. And that's even more complex. For the normal multi-objective problems in science, when I publish a paper, I can take any uh, optimization algorithm that, that finds me something in this, in this search space. Of course, it's very difficult. Yeah? There are the discrete and continuous mixed and uh, hidden areas and so forth. But it's, it's doable. But the moment you have people in a loop, then you need other methods. And, and then, of course, you have smart city, but then you have, uh, I don't know, 125 smart cities, and uh, you try to optimize it on that scale, so on a scale of a small country. And then this is going to be <laughs> another layer, because then it's not only that you may optimize each of those cities, but what happens if you try to optimize it on a country level? Yeah, and optimization means investment, and the investments in the infrastructure, like a heating grid or an electricity grid, 
are bizarre numbers. Uh, this, the amounts that you're investing there is beyond any compare. A substation that connects a wind farm, offshore wind farm, we have lots of them, uh, the substation costs a billion euro. Just a little patch of land with some boxes on it, costs a billion euro. So if you have a calculation error of 10%, you have to justify that in your model. Any more questions? I just wanted to point out to the problem of scalability. So what is the scale of the models you will be talking about? The scale of the systems, as Martin mentioned, can be any possible size yeah. from city <coughs> to continent. But what is the current state of the art of the abilities of the simulators in terms of scale of the systems? Yeah. We're not yet there uh, where I want to be, or where you believe that I am. Um, we have individual components that we have uh, pimped up in scalability. For instance, load flow solvers are usually a couple of thousand nodes. We have now versions running with hundreds of thousands of nodes. So this is uh, encouraging, but the, the scope of the optimization is always limited. So either we are only in the distribution grid yeah, with a couple of thousand nodes, but we're not looking to the next distribution grid. So cross-talk from A to B is still underdeveloped. And these smart city projects uh, were quite shallow. Yeah? We started top-down, so we didn't start modeling all the heat pumps and the cars and everything else that we find in the city. No, it started from the top-down and stopped at a certain level. Yeah? So you might model a block of houses, but not in each individual apartment anymore. Fitting the, the models in a way that it still gives you good enough answers is the, is the high art. Uh, you have some statistical data, and the, the main problem is for, for a scientific approach, if I, you, you, could, you, you could describe these models with Modelica and all the other tools that I've shown you, but if the, the, the models then require you to explicitly specify what type of concrete is that to get the thermal conductivity and the thermal inertia and what type of uh, ventilation system is it what machine what is the rating and so on you you maybe can do that here yeah, taking a sample <laughs> bring it to the lab but you cannot do it in a in a in a city in china with 15 million inhabitants and if you go to the city administration they tell you the only data you get is, yeah, the buildings were built between the 50s and the 60s, and this was built in the 70s. But they don't tell you if there is a gas stove or electricity or coal or nothing in there. You get leaky data, wrong data, and you have to fit this in somehow that it fits. So that's the level where it stops. The models themselves, if you would have the data, would not scale anyway. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.